Uh, Ms. Garvey. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and members of the Commission. Thank you for this opportunity to testify and to provide my perspective as Administrator of the Federal Aviation Administration from August of 1997 until August of 2002. I recognize, as many before me have uh, recognized, the importance of the Commission's work. Today, I'd like to discuss the assumptions and the policies that underscored the aviation security program that was in place on September 11, 2001. I hope that my testimony contributes to an understanding of the history and helps to inform the recommendations that will come from the Commission's work. On September 10, 2001, by statute, civil aviation security in the United States was a shared responsibility. Air carriers had the primary responsibility for screening passengers and baggage and for applying security measures to everything that went on their planes. Airports were responsible for keeping a secure ground environment and for providing law enforcement support. Government's role, that is the FAA's role, was regulatory. By rulemaking, the FAA set the security standards for U.S. airports, for U.S. airlines worldwide, and for foreign air carriers flying to the United States. The FAA also ensured compliance with those standards. On September 10th, we were not a nation at war. On September 10th, we were a nation bedeviled by delays, concerned about congestion, and patient to keep moving. On September 10th, aviation security was responsive to the assessed threat based on information from intelligence and law enforcement agencies. Within the FAA, the Office of Civil Aviation Security was the primary office uh, responsible for security. The FAA, as others may point out, was not an intelligence gathering organization. Threat analysis was conducted in collaboration with the U.S. intelligence and law enforcement communities and based on raw and finished intelligent products supplied to the FAA from these communities. Aviation became a high-profile target in the 60s when hijackers took over flights and diverted one after another to Cuba. By the 1970s, government responded with a series of countermeasures that included tougher penalties, closing safe havens, and the use of airport metal detectors. Those measures helped to stem the domestic hijacking epidemic. In the 1980s, the nation's attention was drawn to the greater threat overseas to U.S. carriers, first with the three-week ordeal of TWA Flight 847 in 1985. This attack led to Congress instituting FAA's first intelligence division, authorizing staff overseas to work with American carriers and foreign airports, and the re-emphasis of the Federal Air Marshal Program for international flights. But it was the bombing of Pan Am 103 in 1988 that was the crucible for aviation security. The world saw the devastating effects of an explosive device and checked luggage, this incident uh, stimulated the most significant changes in aviation security since the 1970s. Based on the findings of the Presidential Commission, Congress elevated the stature of uh, aviation security within the FAA. It directed the use of explosive detection systems. It gave it, at the FAA additional responsibility for research and heightened the emphasis on intelligent and threat assessments. As a result of the 90 Commission, the FAA established a special group to uh, simulate criminal and terrorist actions and to conduct covert examinations of the effectiveness of aviation security systems. This red team augmented the work being done by the inspectors and reported to the top FAA security official. Red team findings influenced screener, screener trainings, led to changes in the computer-assisted profiling program, and helped direct changes in the protocol for positive bag match. In effect, they helped shape the policy and the direction for security programs. Over the years, the uh, U.S. aviation uh, security community had its successes. A frustration in aviation security, as it is in safety, is measuring success, since it is the absence of failure. The positive results are usually unseen. Some have suggested that the greatest aviation security accomplishment was thwarting Ramsey Yosef's 1995 plan to bomb as many as 12 U.S. jetliners nearly simultaneously. 
working with the Philippine authorities, the U.S. law enforcement and intelligence uh, officials uncovered the plot to destroy U.S. passenger aircraft in the Pacific by putting explosive devices aboard. FAA immediately issued specific countermeasures for U.S. carriers operating in that region and adjusted its countermeasures as more information about the new approaches the terrorists were planning became available. Thanks to solid and integrated intelligence, as well as to coordination among the intelligence and law enforcement communities, the plot was stopped. Earlier in 93, after the World Trade uh, Center bombings, FAA had begun re-examining its assumptions about domestic aviation security. This concern was heightened given the connection between the recent plot and the 1993 World Trade Center bombing. At this time, the FAA initiated discussions within the executive branch, Congress, and the industry on the greater domestic threat to aviation. The FAA achieved some consensus that domestic security uh, measures in place, uh, what we call our baseline, needed to be redesigned. The FAA established a baseline working group composed of government and outside experts. Its first meeting was on July 17th, 1996. TWA Flight 800 crashed into the Atlantic that evening. It's not surprising the initial focus on the cause of this crash was criminal, most likely terrorists. The President acted uh, swiftly establishing the White House Commission on Aviation Safety and Security, uh, or known as the Gore Commission. That commission's security recommendations centered on improving screening and countering the effects of explosive devices. At the time of the September 11th tax, FAA had implemented 24 of the Commission's 27, excuse me, security recommendations assigned to the FAA and was addressing through others, three others through rulemaking. With the Gore Commission's determination that aviation security was a national security issue, for the first time significant federal funding was directed toward the purchase of security equipment for civil aviation, $100 million a year. Most of that funding was directed to explosive detection equipment. On September 10th, the FAA was procuring and installing explosive detection equipment. We were focused on improving screener in, in, uh, performance through training and standards. And on September 10th, based on intelligence reporting, we saw explosive devices on aircraft as the most dangerous threat. We were also concerned about what, about what we now think of as traditional hijacking, in which the hijacker ceases, contr seizes control of the aircraft for transportation, or in which passengers are held as hosti hostages to further some political agenda. The most powerful weapon the hijackers carried on 9-11 was not box cutters. It was their knowledge that our aviation systems policy was to get the passengers on the ground safely. And that meant negotiation, not confrontation. We can all share some blame in hindsight for not seeing the jeopardy in that policy. But it was developed and continued over decades as a policy that we knew from experience would save lives. No one had to order that policy changed. The men and women on the fourth airplane that crashed in Pennsylvania changed that policy. It will never be our country's policy again. We shouldn't make the mistake of thinking this trage tragedy was fundamentally about then legal box cutters carried on the planes. We are fighting an intelligence war against small special operations type teams of suicide uh, pilots in aviation's case, and they will always be gaming the ways to get around the holes in whatever mass deployment and system-wide policies we develop. Such small terrorist team, which can train for years, prize predictability of procedures and expectations above all else in their planning. And so our job is to give them non-predictable and some non-publicized layers of security in our aviation system. This is much more important, a much more important focus than hoping we can foresee and intercept every potential weapon that a determined terrorist team may devise from seemingly harmless items in the future. 
We are fighting a special operations war within a public transportation system. And our greatest challenge may not be improving security. That may be the easy part. It's how to improve security and keep the system convenient and affordable to 700 million passengers. The terrorists have two ways to undermine our aviation system. Future successful attacks or the effects of security measures that drive away the traveling public. Our job is to make sure that neither one happens. Thank you very much.